Good evening and welcome to, well, it's hard to say with a co-op with 52 years. I was going to say the, uh, the inaugural candidate forum of Hunger Mountain Co-op, but uh, this sort of thing might have happened 20 or 40 years ago and been lost in our institutional memory. Uh, but I'm Carl Etnayer. I serve the co-op as president of the council. And we put together this candidate forum this year because there was requests for it last year. And there was a lot of other things going on at this time last year. There wasn't capacity to uh, put together a forum like this. It was a contested election. And we thought, you know, it would be really helpful for members to get a chance to talk to the candidates and, and understand what they see for a future of the co-op, what their vision is. And so this year, the council responded to the requests from the community for a forum like this. It turns out we do not have a contested election this year. And in, in fact, we have, at this point, we just had a candidate candidate drop out. So we have five candidates for six open positions. But nonetheless, I'm glad that so many people have turned out. And I hope there are many people who will be watching the recording that Orca is uh, making for us, uh, because this is a really good chance to get to know the people who will be uh, part of the council. Uh, some of them already are. And, uh, and some of them will be elected just automatically the way uh, that the, the candidate situation works. It's, it's helpful to build these relationships, democracy and local co-ops is, is all about relationships, talking to your neighbors, uh, serving on the council and, uh, and hearing from them. So it's great that you're all here. To moderate tonight's forum, we've invited back a former council member who was term limited out. We have a 10 year term limit on the council and uh, Scott Hess was term limited out after serving uh, for president, as president for many of those years. And uh, I served with him uh, when he was president and uh, was really pleased with his leadership in the council. And as president, I have turned to him for, for advice in the past year. So I'm very glad that he's come down here to moderate Moderate tonight. Scott, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you to the thank you to the candidates for coming. Um, much appreciated. I'll go through the format in just, uh, in just a sec. Um, I especially want to thank um, Mary, Rowan, and Carl and Jess for putting this all together and a uh, nice spread that we have here. So welcome, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll... Um, We'll have some interesting dialogue and, and some questions. We can always uh, have some more questions from the audience if you'd, um, if you'd like. So we do have four, um, we do have four positions, uh, five, five positions, five positions, six positions. We've got five people running. Um, so obviously, congratulations to your hard-fought <laughs> victory. You, you all did a wonderful job. If anyone has an interest um, in uh, that open position, that will um, almost assuredly be appointed by the new council um, in November. So please contact Carl at your earliest convenience, or you can ask some friends and, and uh, acquaintances, and, uh, and they can apply. Um, um, being a member of the council, uh, they call it the council, but it's, it's, it's akin to being a board of director, basically the same thing. Um, the overall macro, um, the general manager is directly um, accountable to the council, and um, when it comes to approving budgets, um, that's where the uh, the council comes in. In addition to advising, and many topics are discussed um, from ho usually from more of a macro level. I want to thank Orca for coming down and taping this. Much appreciated. And um, we'll go into um, well, we're going to have uh, answers to some questions. There are some people that are are currently members of the council um, and others that don't have as much insight. So there's no, um, there's not a problem if you just, if you don't have the insight or, or don't want to answer the question because you don't have that knowledge. So we can, you can just move on and just say, I don't, I don't have the, the where, not the wherewithal, but the knowledge to answer it. Um, please um, stick to the question, uh, answer the question that is, that is asked and, um, the, the format, uh, we're going to have some openings. We're going to have opening statements, three minutes each. Um, and I'll just, I'll give a brief explanation. I've, I've got a whole list of um, questions that were submitted from the, uh, from our, from the public or from the members. If you, have a, if you have some questions after that from the audience, please don't hesitate. We, we encourage you to raise your hand and ask questions of our, uh, 
of our candidates. We'll have some closing statements afterwards. Each candidate will have the opportunity to uh, express those. And then we encourage you to stick around for uh, the informal meet and greet right afterwards. And you can just go up and personally speak to the uh, candidates. So we will begin. We have I want to thank the candidates for coming. We have four out of the five candidates. Laurel Antler was not able to uh, join us this evening. Giles um, Brule is here, and Stephen Farnham on the end, uh, Devorah Jonas, and Thomas Graham. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you in the audience for, um, for participating and, uh, and joining us. So why don't we get right into the, um, your opening statements? You have, up, you have up to three minutes to um, talk about whatever you would like. Basic, ba basically, for the, uh, for the opening, um, if you can present your background, your qualifications, your vision for the co-op, and any key issues that you would like to address. And you have up to three minutes. Giles, would you like to start? Thank you. Hi, I'm Giles Brule, and let me see if I can not talk too loud. Uh, my name is Giles Brule, and uh, I'm actually an employee currently of the co-op. I've been working there for 25 years, um, full-time. I'm currently the information systems manager there. Um, and I was interested in running for the council because over the last several years, I've seen a, uh, a lack of candidates, and that concerned me. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we had people that were not just qualified to run for council, but interested in running, uh, interested in putting in the time and um, trying to tackle the things that the council needs to do to support the staff. Um, I'm interested in uh, making sure that the council adheres to uh, policy governance and to the systems to, um, that it needs to take care of so the staff can take care of what they need to take care of. And um, I would say, I'll keep it short, um, the issues that personally interest me, uh, whether or not that these can be addressed directly from the council or not, is complicated. But I would say affordability is one of the big things that um, that I worry about, you know, um, there's a lot of people who would like to shop at our co-op who can't. Um, so that's a big issue for me. Um, and seeing where the co-op goes from here now, you know, we've, we're a big store and we're, we're doing the best we can. Um, we're doing just about max sales in the store we're in. So at some point in order to um, keep supporting the economy and uh, the community, we're gonna have to grow in some way. So um, that's an important way for the council to support the staff and seeing where that goes next, so. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm Devorah Jonas. I grew up in co-op housing, I shopped at co-op grocery stores and took the co-op for. Now? Do we really need this? <laughs> now for that. It's being, it's, being, it's being recorded. Oh, and that's why they need it. We need the microphone. Not you. I grew up in co-op housing, shopped at a co-op grocery store, and took co-ops for granted. With time, I saw co-ops fail. In 2018, Harvest Co-op in Boston went under after 50 years. I was part of an active group of members trying to save the store. Why was it in trouble? The GM didn't change prices to reflect the increased use and cost to the co-op of credit cards. The end of the member worker program because of federal ruling. And the GM didn't respond to the changed conditions. He didn't hire more staff to replace the eyes and helpfulness of the member, former member workers. And he was ignoring comments from members and staff and making decisions alone. When the membership finally realized the sad physical and financial condition of the store, the lack of communication between them, the council, and the GM was the final straw. Regarding Hunger Mountain Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, sorry. I want to see it strong into the future. We have our own challenges. Our members are exhausted from unseasonable heat and from digging out from floods. COVID changed the way we interact. Co-ops are dynamic and individual. Like any living organization, they require constant and respectful diligence. How do we respond to international corporations selling organic foods? Are we content with our product mix? Are we maintaining our community centeredness? How do we keep innovating to remain competitive, to provide good working conditions and pay, and to empower members by being involved with decision making? 
How do we support small innovative vendors? A co-op works when there's communication and response between staff and membership, and management, sorry. Members tell council about changes they'd like to see. Council tells the GM, staff have the power and responsibility to speak up with ideas and complaints without fear of retaliation. I'm running for council to advocate for the council to instruct the general manager <laughs> to resist corporate pressure and stay strong to our mission, including involvement of members in major decisions like expansions, fair treatment and pay and safe working conditions for staff, members involved in product choice, educational opportunities for co-op members, staff, management, and the general community, and involvement in the larger community. I'm a numbers person. That means I ask questions until I understand the financials. I also ask questions about staffing levels, working conditions, and any other controversial issues that arise. I promise to keep asking questions and to keep pushing the council to push the general manager to include staff and members in all major decisions. Hey, can folks hear me? Good. Um, yeah, I'm T. Graham. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I am a student and a uh, working class person. I know a lot of the working class people in this community, um, people I know who worked at the co-op until recently uh, were made persistently homeless by the flood of 2023. Um, and so I come at this with a desire to kind of balance these priorities of affordability, as Giles mentioned. I think that's a really important point, people being able to afford the groceries they buy. Um, you know, the main reason I shop at the co-op is because I have an allergy that's really hard to accommodate. If I didn't have that, I would probably have to shop at a cheaper store. Um, but um, I think that, you know, also making sure that workers are paid enough and that the workers who work for our vendors are paid enough. You know, th those are all, I know those pull in different directions, but those are all really important priorities. And the thing that really, you know, got me involved and wanting to run was um, the sexual abuse scandal that happened a couple years ago through the co-op. And I know that we have had some changes in management, but I also know that some of these types of scandal involve structural problems. And so I just wanna make sure that we have the policies and the awareness and um, you know a structure all the way through that not just has the right rules in place so that that kind of thing doesn't happen. We don't have five victims coming forward ignored before the sixth one goes to the police. Not just those, um, you know, rules in place, but also like a, a culture within the co-op where those rules are actually enforced and acted upon appropriately. And, you know, maybe there have been some changes, but I just want to kind of, you know, get inside this organization and, and really make sure that those kinds of changes are happening and make sure that we're balancing priorities for our most marginalized community members. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Farnham. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I reside in the town of Plainfield. Um, I've been on the council before, and I'm running for election to be on it again. I am a member of, um, I've forgotten now how many co-ops. I was a member of what's now known as City Market years ago. <clears throat> I've been, I am a member of the Plainfield co-op. I'm a member of the Hunger Mountain co-op. I'm a member of an insurance cooperative. I'm a member of a banking cooperative, uh, <clears throat> and probably two or three others that I've forgotten. Uh, and I'm also, I've served on various boards in the past, the Cutler Library in Plainfield, Board of Civil Authority in Plainfield, um, Board of the Vermont Philharmonic, and as I mentioned, I've served on this board for a while. I have the bug, I guess you could say. Um, in in addition to the um, nuts and bolts issues that Giles mentioned earlier regarding just the fiduciary responsibilities of keeping the co-op stable and <clears throat> growing and doing well, I like to push us towards innovative ideas and innovative solutions. Um, there's a lot of folks who come to our co-op from distant communities um, I'd like to know if it'd be a good idea to have a food truck that could travel to those communities so that uh, they don't have to travel so far to come here. Um, the main, to me, there's 
two, uh, two possibilities, one being that it would reduce the carbon footprint of these folks getting their vittles, and the other being that it would be a way we can serve the community. To me, it's not a matter of we should do this. It's a matter of we, we ought to have the conversation and see if it's viable, see if it would be workable. And there's a variety of other um, ideas that I think you know, perhaps the co-op could be involved in, like community housing and um, other, other community assets. And I think the co-op is in a good position to be involved in or support some of these, some of these things. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I, I plan on voting for all of you. Okay, we, have, we have many, many questions that were actually submitted. And I'm going to try to go through some of them and give them give um, some more broader base. Some of them are very, very specific. And we, um, Hunger Mountain Co-op um, exists or, or um, runs under policy governance. So when it comes down to some really very, not nitpicky, but very specific issues, um, it's those that are not um, relevant to broad-based um, decision-making from the council. Um, Stephen, Stephen mentioned um, uh, board experience. Um, just briefly, do you have any board, ex the rest of you, do you have any board experience that you, or committee experience or with other organizations that you would bring to the Hunger Mountain Co-op co Council? Um, I was the staff rep to the Hunger Mountain Council for uh, about two years. Um, I was also um, a member of the union's executive team uh, as the chief steward for about two and a half years and on the organizing committee. Uh, I would say the experience in that area is somewhat relevant and similar. Um, beyond that, uh, no. So. I've been on the council since January. Um, besides that, I was on, so I've only been in, in the area for four years. So I don't, don't have much, ex I don't have much experience locally. Um, I was living in Somerville, Massachusetts, and I was on the um, board, I guess you'd call it, of the Friends of the Somerville Public Library, and was the president of that group for three years. So I have some experience um, in that way. Uh, most of my uh, nonprofit board experience has just been volunteer-based, but uh, I've been involved in uh, Rights and Democracy's Housing Justice Committee for about a year, and I've done a lot of other sorts of political activism, mostly smaller scale, but um, you know, negotiating those types of political meetings is something that's familiar to me uh, directly through a, a cooperative business, a little bit less so. Um, I think I answered the question. <laughs> Quite in detail. Thank you, and thank you for keeping your your, uh, your answers um, concise and uh, within a minute or so. Um, what do you consider your core areas of expertise and what relevant experience do you have that qualifies you to serve on the council? And you might want to throw in um, that expertise that you could um, help, out, help out with the council and the co-op. Um, as a longtime employee, um, I have a wealth of knowledge about the financials of the store. Um, I was the grocery buyer for six years. Um, I was receiving manager. I've worked in the front end. So I've worked in a lot of different areas, and I've visited a lot of different co-ops and talked with a lot of different um, people over the years. So I have a really good understanding um, of the financials of the business and, and what our long-term challenges are. Um, so I think that's, that's probably my, my best asset. I guess I'd have to say the commitment to communication and observing how, what happens if that breaks down and how that can destroy a, an, an organization and also how it can, re, how having the communication can make the organization thrive. Um, I do like numbers and, <laughs> and so I tend to keep, to keep an eye and to be constantly asking questions about what the financials are or what other things are that are relevant and we'll continue to do that. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, having some activist experience uh, is valuable. And I think also um, just having the firsthand experience of being a working class person, knowing what it's like to struggle to afford groceries, and also knowing a lot of folks who have worked at the co-op and, and, you know, seeing their kind of steadily increasing struggles with the inflation crisis is something that I can bring to the table uh, in a very direct way. And I also am pretty good with numbers. I'm a chemical engineering student, so, um, you know, math is something I can do as well for the financials. Yeah, so there was a time when I was a working class person also. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know as I characterize what I do now as work, uh, or at least I would say it doesn't make a lot of money. But anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, in addition to the fact that the other boards that I mentioned earlier, um, I tend to try to find innovative solutions to problems, whether a problem be something that we're all facing or whether a problem be something that just as a matter of a, as a discussion point try to find a uh, common thread so that we can get to a place where we can solve uh, a disagreement and reach a place where all parties involved can move forward with something that's satisfactory. Thank you, great answers. What, uh, what is your experience in working on a team for common goals? How would you transfer that to the council? Well, as um, most of my experience is limited to my 25 years where I've worked, I, I, but I would say, you know, um, I work in a, a small department and um, we don't always agree, but we work together to, to achieve our goals and that extends to the management team that I work with. You know, we don't always agree, but we resolve our differences and we move forward to be um, productive. and. Um, I would say that, that that should put me in a good place for, for being able to work with people with different viewpoints. Uh, okay. <laughs> so when I was on the board of the Somerville Public Library, um, we did have disagreements. I actually rewrote the bylaws and had to get agreement from everybody to change them. Um, we discuss things and gradually we'd figure out a way to make things happen. The other thing though that I've done is I've worked in laboratories and worked with individuals usually of, in small groups and I've been both the person in charge and the person being charged, <laughs> if you will, and, um, and learned how to, how to maneuver in those situations and how important it was to make sure that say the person who was working with me, that we were both on the same, um, that we both agreed on how to work, that, that the situation had to be resolved and we would work out a way to do it, rather than one person being um, scared of the other or pulling rank on the other, that we, we could work, it, work things through. Uh, yeah, so as far as, you know, teamwork, um, my housing activism and, um, you know, various work experience. I worked at a slaughterhouse for a little while, so that's a, you know, high-paced high environment where there's a lot of, um, you know, teamwork involved in, in um, you know, a more kind of immediate physical labor setting. But uh, I've also done plenty of kind of committee work through my activist life and also uh, just working with um, students from all over the world through um, Winooski CCV when I was a tutor there. Um, just kind of balancing, you know, people learning a new language and coming from very different cultures and bringing a lot of different perspectives also gives me some insights into, you know, working with a lot of different kinds of people. So in my uh, professional career, I used to work in a laboratory where there were several engineers that were in charge of what was going to be done in the lab and I was the technician who worked with them. So it was my job to um, work with those engineers and bring about what it was they wanted done. Um, and in another, in another job at another employer, I was on a crew that maintained um, milling machines that ran uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. And there was somebody on every shift to um, keep those machines running. And it was you know, the team effort involved handing off 
whatever was going on from the previous shift to the next shift or taking on what the previous shift was leaving for you. Um, in more recent team effort, I'll um, um, tip my hat to our current council president, Carl Attenire, who led our uh, bylaw committee in re rewriting the, or I should say revising the uh, Hunger Mountain Co-op bylaws. Um, that was something like a three-year effort um, well, it was more like maybe an eight-year effort, but, but three years when uh, Carl and five other individuals were working on that pretty um, steadily. And it was a very re rewarding experience when, once we finally got them passed. And I think that answers the question. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, <clears throat> I, was on, I was on that committee. It's the only committee I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> um, if elected to the council, how would you ensure, since you're working as a team, obviously, a team of nine, um, if elected to the council, how will you ensure discourse and communication um, is always respectful and civil? And you might, you might even throw in um, your feelings about policy governance, which the council operates under. Um, that's a difficult question, how to ensure it. Uh, I, it's, oh, it's a sorry. from the audience, but you, yeah. you um, what the meaning was. I didn't write it. <laughs> I, I don't think it would be a problem for myself. And I, I think that as long as you have agreed upon rules before you go into something, that is really not an issue. Um, everybody agrees to abide by those rules. Um, as far as, as policy governance is concerned, I think it's essential to the process. It's... Um, it's a cornerstone of um, most co-ops, and without it, you end up with too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, community involvement is incredibly important, and the council uh, oversight is incredibly important, but um, I couldn't imagine our co-op functioning without it. Well, I think there's no way to ensure that discourse remains civil but I can make it my point that I remain civil, and if we all agree to that, then we will have civil discourse. <laughs> um, policy governments works. Um, there's some perhaps different interpretations about what some of the uh, of, of ways that some of things are done, and that's those are things we need to discuss civilly. Um, yeah, I would agree that I think, um, you know, it is important to have ground rules for how people engage with each other in order to be able to engage productively. And again, my experience having done that is both through, you know, um, working as a, um, as a tutor at the community college and through my political activist experience in a bunch of different realms, but particularly housing justice, you know, attending these meetings every week and, and um, talking to a group of folks who have various perspectives and are coming from various places, um, you know, balancing all that stuff and being respectful is uh, crucial. Well, I certainly agree with Devorah's uh, point that she should remain civil. But <laughs> uh, and I also agree with her point that I, I don't know any way to ensure it. Um, um, as far as I can tell, it's up to each individual uh, to bring a respectful attitude to the table. And I think my favorite um, ground rule is to remain curious. And that pretty much, um, if you can do that one, then the others kind of fall in place naturally. Because whatever somebody's saying, um, if you remain curious about it, then you leave yourself open to the possibility that it's going to come to a place you didn't expect it to. And the result might be something you actually wanted to hear. And so um, I, I think, as I said, I don't think there's any way to guarantee it, but I think each individual can participate in a positive way and make it happen. Thank you. Uh, I was supposed to mention in the beginning, there are bathrooms in the, be in the when you walk in and bathrooms over there. And the way you came in is the way you go out. Um, <laughs> What is, the, uh, one, what is one big thing you would like to impact by being on the council? 
Some of you may have alluded to it before, but if you want to just expand upon it. I would love to see a uh, larger community involvement in the co-op. Um, everybody that came here today, is, it's awesome. I would love to see more people. Um, I would love to see uh, our co-op thought of as more than simply a grocery store in our community. And it already is, obviously, but I'd love to push that even further. So um, getting people to run for positions, getting people to volunteer, and um, just getting people interested in about where their food comes from. One is a hard, is, is hard, because there's so many things. Um, I'd like to, I guess I'd like to see people learning to eat different things to try out some of the grains that we sell, um, like barley and um, millet and quinoa and soy products, and therefore reduce the amount of energy, well, reduce the amount of meat and fish that we use. But also, there are things like um, couscous that can be prepared by just boiling, pouring boiling water over it and leaving it for five minutes. And I don't know that people know these things, or maybe they do, but I would be curious to see, or interested to see, um, either forums or demonstrations of using different kinds of food and talking about what the possibilities are to reduce our footprint. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I think if there's one issue I would kind of prioritize, it would be um, just making sure that, you know, the structural changes have been made to ensure that something like what Reese Winkle John did cannot happen again and is handled and treated very differently in a much more serious way earlier. And um, yeah, if that's, the, the, you know, there are other issues that I think are also important, but if that's kind of the, the main one that I can be known for, then um, yeah, that's what I'll run on. I love this question, Scott. In nine years of serving on the board with you, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Uh, what, what would I like to do that would, be, that would have the most impact? Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to our fellow board member who's not here tonight, uh, Catherine Lother, who's done, who, well, actually her and her committee, and I'm sorry I don't know the names of all the folks on the committee, the Sustainability Committee, who um, led the effort a few years ago so that the co-op was able to purchase a solar array, and I think what, something like 70% of our energy is now generated by that. Uh, I think that's a great success. And I think carbon footprint reduction is one of the most important things that we, as an organization, should attempt to address any way that we can. And I think most of the efforts right now are inside of the store. And I'd like to see us explore opportunities outside of the store. I mean, the co-op is a cooperative form of a grocery store. I mean. We all, we all know what it is. You drive your car there and you get your stuff and you go home. And I would like us to examine the possibilities of a different way to get our grocery needs met. You know, is it possible that we could get into some kind of neighborhood food distribution that's similar to what, you know, the, the milkman used to do that drove around the neighborhood and brought groceries to, um, um, to people's, right to people's doorstep? Is the carbon footprint of having the grocery store drive around the neighborhood greater, or is it greater have every individual drive their own private car to the store? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'd like us to look into these kinds of issues and see if there are ways outside our walls that we can have a positive impact on the environment. Thank you, great answers. And anybody in the audience at, at any point, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll be more than happy to. Sure. Just keep it relevant to the council and not too, too specific to the store. Please identify yourself. Yes, and please identify yourself. Hi. Alan Rome, I've been a co-op member for a long time. Um, I guess this is a question about um, the sensitivity of labor relations. And um, 
you know, you all have working backgrounds. You've been an employer, uh, at least you've been an employee. Um, and here you are about to be on the council. Some have been on council for a long time. And obviously we have collective bargaining representative uh, that uh, represents the employees. And uh, I just like to know your thoughts on uh, the uh, challenging job and the important job of uh, listening to management, but on the other hand, listening to labor and coming to some sort of collaboration. And what are your, uh, let's say your talents to do such things? Thank you, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, I will begin this by saying that in my understanding, mostly what you're asking about is actually a operational issue. So collective bargaining happens between the management and the collective bargaining unit. Um, but on the whole, having sat on both sides of the table, um, I think having a good relationship relationship is incredibly important. Um, I think that a lot of the goals on both sides of the tables are um, are the same. Um, the co-op wants to provide good wages. You know, the collective bargaining will want good wages. How do we achieve that? Um, in the role of a council member, um, I think the way that we would affect that would be being available to support the staff. And when I say staff, I mean management and bargaining unit. Um, in the decisions that they need to move, that they need to uh, pursue to grow the store to, to be able to support them. Because, um, and when I say grow the store, I don't necessarily make the store bigger or sell more groceries. Maybe the store diversifies, maybe it does something else. There's lots of business opportunities. Um, but in the model we're in right now, we can't generate much more money. Inflation's keeping going up and our wages will become less competitive unless we figure out how to do that. And, and it, being able to meet those kind of demands, typically those economic demands are the largest part of a um, collective bargaining agreement. So that, that would be my answer on that. Can I just say, I agree with Giles? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, my own experience, I have been uh, a non-unionized employee at a lot of different places, and I know how that struggle is, and I also, you know, am close with and friends with a lot of uh, employees and former employees at the co-op who say they, um, you know, like having a union, but there are still struggles, and so uh, making sure I'm you know, tapped into those and, and listening to folks who used to work there and who still work there, getting that input, I think is really important. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, balancing that priority between making sure our wages are fair and just, and also trying to keep our groceries affordable. That's, you know, that's the balance that really matters to me. So I believe the question is about labor relations. Um, and, um, I'll try to spare you a lecture on policy governance, but from the, from the council or board perspective with policy governance, the interaction between the, uh, the board and the um, general manager is the connection to the rest of the employees in the business. So there is no direct link um, between employees and the council other than just kind of informal conversation that we might have when we meet each other in the store. As far as what happens in the, in the uh, council meetings themselves, we get our information from the general manager and we respond to that. Um, I would like to see a more open system. There have been people who have urged us to explore other governance models other than policy governance. I don't know if there is a better one. We have not explored others. I'd be open to doing that. But I do think um, labor relations, um, I'm optimistic that they can be improved and I hope they are. Thank you. Tell us about a time when you had to deal with a difficult board member or in a professional or a professional relation. How did you respond and what was the outcome? I, 
Um, there have been times in my working career where um, I may have been in a, a tense situation, a disagreement with an employee um, or with my boss. And I, uh, there's um, one incident that comes to mind that without going into names, um, where there was a disagreement about something and, and I got really heated about it to the point where I had overstepped my, my professional bounds um, and being called on that directly um, and being able to take a step back and reflect and realize I had done that is incredibly important. Um, so I think that, you know, trying to remember that everybody that's at the table, you know, is most likely, we're talking the vast majority of people are there with the same goal. You know, they're trying to support our business. They're trying to achieve whatever business goal you're working on. Um, and in remembering that and, um, and just trying to be open to what, what they're talking about. And um, like we said, you know, be curious and, and be receptive, so. When I was president of the Friends of the Somerville Public Library, um, there were disagreements. And eventually, I mean, so, I mean, mostly we just got to spend money. I mean, we raised money by selling books, and we spent it be, for making programs for the library. I mean, that was, was our job. Um, but in spite of that, disagreements would occur from time to time. And it was hard. Um, I had one person who, can, no matter what I said, said the opposite. And that's very awkward. But eventually, after two years, they got tired of it. And they left, which was probably the best solution. This was a person who had been the president of the group before me and had been always complaining that she didn't want to be president anymore. And so I said, OK, I'll do it. And I only realized afterwards that she only wanted to complain. She still wanted the position, but she wanted to complain about it. And that made it really hard to run meetings and to take care of business. But eventually, uh, I prevailed. Yeah, as far as my uh, nonprofit board experience, I haven't had too many uh, really difficult situations. I mean, you know, working in housing justice occasionally will have you know, we've mostly met by Zoom meetings and will occasionally have, um, you know, a conservative landlord or someone similar find out about the Zoom meeting and jump in and kind of try to derail things. And that's where we, you know, um, try to engage in good faith as best we can, but also kind of, um, you know, help lead the person kind of out of their mission of, of derailing the meeting. Uh, I've also had plenty of difficult experiences, you know, in other kind of work settings, you know, at the slaughterhouse in particular. And uh, yeah, I think just being able to make sure there's there's space to, you know, um, get away when things get really difficult is important. But I think I also expect that, you know, at a professional nonprofit board kind of situation, things will be pretty different. And, um, you know, I think that respectful discourse rule is, is really the same answer. Um, yeah, when I, when I get into a heated, animated, or difficult conversation with somebody, I just try to shout louder. Um, no, seriously, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, you know, these things happen. It's human nature, and you should accept that we're emotional creatures, and occasionally things get a little out of hand. And generally, it seems to me the best approach is to take a deep breath and de-escalate and, and uh, make space so that each individual can express themselves and do so fully and in, a, in an environment in which they're being respected. Again, thank you. How should the council balance transparency with confidentiality? Um. It sounds like a hard subject, but I don't think that it is. Uh, there are very clearly defined legal boundaries uh, that cover those issues. Um, everything that is not within those should be transparent. I mean, we are a open to our membership kind of business. Um, so I, I think that um, 
The harder part is communicating uh, when something meets that boundary um, and in doing so in a, a very clear manner. Um, some people are never gonna be happy with that answer, but the reality is that there are sometimes uh, situations that we just don't have that option. But um, outside that boundary, I think uh, the more communication, the better. Yeah, I get pretty much agree with that. There are rules, there are some specific things that have to be kept confidential because making them public would endanger the co-op um, in some fashion or would give uh, competitors advantage. But other, and then and there are personnel issues where um, confidential, uh, confidentiality is required and I think necessary. But other than that, as much as possible, we should make things transparent. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, the transparency issue seems to be related to kind of the structural problems I was alluding to earlier. I, I think there are cases where, um, you know, I don't want to call out the co-op in particular because I don't, you know, yet know exactly how these decisions are made internally. But I know that some institutions that have certain structural problems and where abuse has been enabled to some extent will use um, confidentiality language in order to try to cover that. And so one of my goals if I'm on the council is to kind of just provide a check to make sure that that's not happening, but also still protect confidentiality in a way that you know keeps people safe who need to be kept safe. Um, so making sure that that's the priority. Yeah, I think I think Giles pretty much nailed it when he answered the question that there's certain regulations you have to follow and certain things that must remain confidential and that has to happen. Beyond that, anything that is not confidential, I'm pretty much a fan of transparency. Um, I've been part of the I was part of the effort that got it so that all of our council meetings are recorded. I was part of an effort later on to defend that when some folks are questioning it and wondering whether we should continue. And uh, as the um, current secretary and secretary for about five years now, I have tried to make sure that we have a very uh, detailed set of minutes uh, for folks to read. And I, I wanna give my thanks to uh, Rowan and Allison who take very good notes for our meetings as well. Thomas, you mentioned um, if you get on the council, uh, I'm pretty confident. I, um, how do you approach problem solving and decision making? Um, so as, a, as an IT professional, this is what I do all day is problem solving. Um, and I think the most important thing is to get the most information you can. You can't solve any problem unless you really understand the situation. Um, so, so the most important thing for me would be to, to get as much information to really understand what's really being asked. Um, and decision making, um, I think, you know, given the circumstance, you want to have input, you want to um, look at the values, the pros and cons, and then um, just make sure that you've given it considerable thought. Uh, I'd start out with brainstorming, making as far out suggestions as people feel like, and then narrowing them down to possibilities, um, and then discussing them until you, one came to agreement. Yeah, I guess uh, I'd agree with that, and then, then I would add just, you know, through my academic experience, I think, um, you know, trusting expertise, depending on what type of problem it is, you try to find people who have either, um, you know, the experience of being most negatively affected by the problem or um, are in some way qualified experts in dealing with the problem. And you get input from people who, you know, really know uh, the, the specific situation. Well, it depends on what the problem is you want to solve. If the problem you're trying to solve is a difference uh, of opinion in the group on how to approach a particular situation, uh, I like to tease it apart and look at its individual constituent pieces and see if there is a way that we can meet the needs of the two disparate groups and put together a solution that everybody can agree on. 
if it's a, a problem that for the most part the a group agrees on, then similar approach. You take the problem apart and try to find out which parts can we solve, maybe which parts we can't, and try to come up with a solution. Great, thank you. This is a, a bit of a long question, but I'll try to get to um, many that were submitted. Uh, basically, the last sentence is the most relevant. But thanks to our commitment to generous pay and benefits, Hunger Mountain currently um, has compensation expenses that are one of the highest percentage of the total budget um, for peer co-ops. At the same time, we're trying to keep prices affordable. Next year, the union contract is scheduled to be renewed. Under the co-op's governance structure, the council hires the general manager and empowers her to make operational decisions like negotiating the contract and deciding on pricing structure. As long as she meets the goals that the council sets for finances, employee, welfare, etc., please describe how you would use your seat on the council to discuss topics like this with the general manager. So this is one of those topics that's difficult for me to he's a part as an employee because that's not going to relate to what I would do on the board. Um, but I, I think, you know, setting the expectations of the general manager and um, the goals for that is the first part. And the second part is um, being receptive to listen to the general manager um, in what's going on throughout the year and, and being able to put in the time to resolve those issues. Um, it's one of those topics that is very um, divided by policy governance. You know, this is a responsibility of, of operations of the, of the management to do, and it's our operations to make sure that the general manager would meet those benchmarks. That's our, the responsibility of the council. So I would be concerned that the pay structure we came up with was relevant to the community. That is, we are required, I believe we're required, um, to pay at least the Vermont living wage. If the wage in the, in the area is higher than that, that means, so I think we should be aiming at paying the higher of the wage that is in the area and the Vermont living wage. And that we should be asking the general manager to see, even if that's a large percentage of our budget, maybe there are other places in the budget that could be reduced, even, you know, even if it makes it a larger percentage. I don't think that's what the question is. The question is, how, how do we get enough money to pay the people what they need to be paid in order to be able to shop at the co-op? And I would suggest looking for other places in the budget that could be reduced. Maybe because we can join with other co-ops in some fashion about purchasing, um, Whatever. I mean, we would, we would look to see what other costs can be reduced so that we could pay sufficiently. Yeah, I agree with that. As I've been saying all along, you know, I think the um, two biggest budgetary priorities need to be keeping groceries affordable and keeping people paid fairly. And, um, you know, those are priorities that kind of work against each other. And, of course, there's also the issue of making sure your vendors are um, taken care of and that their employees are taken care of. So, um, you know, I think as far as what we as counselors expect of the general manager, just making sure there's transparency so that we can really look at that budget and making sure that it's, it's running that way as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, making that balance of priorities really to take care of, especially, you know, I mean, when you have a pool of money, you know, I know something that, um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did is she had a budget for her staff and she equalized it so that the lowest paid staffers were paid more because the highest paid were paid less. That kind of, you know, progressive equalization can be a good thing to do if you have, you know, a fixed budget to work with, but also understanding, you know, it's a business, it's not a fixed budget. So finding ways to, um, as Dora said, cut other costs and, um, you know, balancing those priorities. That's, that's the key. 
Well, thankfully, with policy governance, the council doesn't have to doesn't have to solve this problem. But um, to the point of you know how to be how to work with the GM and uh, how to be supportive in that effort, uh, I would tend to agree that we should look into um, um, I guess for lack of a better word, progressive salary structure uh, as a way to um, make sure our staff and employees are compensated appropriately and. A few years ago, there was an interesting conversation that we had in the um, council about whether or not we should encourage our customers to pay by credit card, check, or cash. And it comes down to, among other things, how much money the co-op gets to keep, but it also comes down to how long the transaction takes and how much time the cashier is dedicating to each individual transaction. And it, it's kind of an interesting quandary. On the one hand, we like to be a good employer in town and we like to create jobs. But on the other hand, we want to be efficient and we don't want to waste a lot of time and be paying th people to be doing things that, that, is, um, that takes resources that we, don't ha we cannot afford. So and these are the kinds of um, uh, balances that we have to work with. And as I said, it's the GM's responsibility and management's responsibility to decide what's the right balance. And I think the board's or the council's role in this situation is to understand that and to be supportive of it. Can I make no. one more comment? No, you can't. I'm kidding. Um, just the comment that if we pay more, we will have less turnover, which means we'll be paying less money for training people which will allow us to have more money to pay people. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> the co-op's mission includes a number of ends. Some in the grocery co-op world describe the importance of earning a profit or margin by saying, no margin, no mission. That is, if the co-op isn't making money, it, isn't, it, it can't carry out the rest of its mission. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I think absolutely. I think that there are always boundaries to every statement. Um, but the great thing about having uh, a co-op instead of a standard business is that our money goes back to the members uh, via patronage refund and it goes into uh, expenses. So grocery stores operate on a razor thin margin, uh, cooperatives even more so. Um, one of the reasons why I think that we need to figure out how we can diversify and grow the business is just that. If we don't make more money, we will not be able to offer staff a more competitive wage. Um, so yes, I think that's true. I, I think you could abuse that statement to make it um, not mean, I think, what it does. But, but yes, no, I, I think that's true. Well, we have to earn something in order to stay in business. And then it's a question of how much. Um, we need to have, it, it does cost to have community involvement. It does cost to support Montpelier Alive events. It does cost to do pretty much anything, but the money comes back. So definitely we always have to be on the positive side of, of income, but it doesn't have to be all that great because, because our bottom line isn't just what comes out, you know, what the profit is at the end of the year. Our bottom line is the whole community activity. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, theoretically, we're supposed to be a nonprofit. And so I think um, making sure that we're whole and we're not, you know, in debt is obviously important so we can keep operating. But beyond that, the priorities should really be, like I said, most affordable groceries, taking care of vendors, taking care of the planet, and taking care of workers. Um, and so if that means that, you know, the overall profit has to be a little bit less um, in order to prioritize what we're supposed to prioritize as a nonprofit, um, then so be it, as long as we're still, you know, whole and um, able to keep operating. Well, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the triple bottom line, which I believe is making sure you stay solvent, uh, meeting environmental and social targets as well. And, um, I, I think it, it goes 
both ways. If you don't have a margin, you don't have a mission. But if you don't have a mission, you don't have a margin. Um, and again, I, it's, um, it's an ongoing dialogue, and it's something that we work on pretty much steadily. Stephen, I'll let you answer this question first. What makes the co-op's mission meaningful to you? Um, the mission uh, to provide a, uh, we're basically a organic market for folks to provide, uh, for us to be able to provide a uh, healthy products for people to consume and to eat and to be a responsible employer and so on. And to me, what that mission means to me is it's just, it's just the right thing to do. Um, not, every, not every grocery store that you go into is particularly concerned with how well their employees are paid or what kind of benefit packages they have. Um, the commercial food business in general may not be particularly committed to how healthy the food is you eat they're more interested in how much money they can make and how much they can siphon off from that to pay the stockholders or the high level executives. And to me, the most important part of the mission is that the co-op is owned by its members, serves its members, and tries to provide the best products uh, available and also tries to keep our members and shoppers informed about how they can live healthier lives. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, for me personally, having a soy allergy, it's as I said, you know, I kind of depend on um, food that is labeled carefully and is, um, you know, safe for me to eat because that's really surprisingly hard to find. <laughs> You'd be amazed if you don't know. Um, but also, I think, you know, the overall um, mission of, yeah, having something that is democratic and accountable to members and, um, you know, can, can have any kind of a mission at all instead of, as, as Steve was mentioning, you know, a for-profit grocery store where the only mission is to make a rich person richer. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as I keep alluding to, the, the balancing of priorities is something that a co-op has the capacity to do, taking care of customers and taking care of workers in a real way, where any grocery store is, you know, that's for-profit is really trying to do as little of that as they can get away with. and. Um, so that's why I think you know co-ops are important, and I really hope to see more cooperative structures of all kinds in the future. Okay, I agree with what's with what's been said, and in addition, I guess to me what's important is keeping money in the community, which means paying people. <laughs> and okay, and also um, letting small vendors, starting out people, have a chance to show their products and get involved. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to if I was going to pick one thing it would be it would be the strength and support that the co-op gives to the local economy through our local vendors. Um, the amount of our sales and our support that comes from those local vendors is amazing. And uh, you know, if we were gone tomorrow, not only of course would we be huge amount of staff without jobs and we wouldn't be able to get our foods but the domino effect that would affect all those local vendors and their staff and the suppliers that they get there from um, would just be you know catastrophic so um, if I was gonna pick one thing that I'm the most proud of and I think the one of the most important things it's it's that um, force that the co-op provides in the local economy does anybody from the audience want to yeah please and state your name, thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Chip Stone. I live in East Montpelier. I've been a member for uh, a pretty long time. Uh, I am a strong supporter of the co-op and its mission, and I've liked it uh, every day that I've been here. A concern that I have about the co-op is affordability. Uh, we are not very good at attracting our neighbors who shop at Walmart. Um, which represent a much larger part of our community than we give credit for. Um, my question for you is, do you each believe, you, you all know the co-op either from having been on the council or working for the organization or studying it as you've, as you've decided to run for this position. 
do you believe the co-op is run as reasonably efficiently as it can be? Are the sales per square foot competitive with other co-ops or like-sized organizations? Are the sales per FTE similar or competitive with other organizations? Are there places we could do better? Are, are there ways we can make this organization uh, and our products more affordable to our community? Thanks. Great, much appreciated. Stephen, I'll start with you again, sort of this end. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, the shopper survey is something we circulate every year and ask folks to fill it in and tell us what they uh, what their opinions are of various aspects of the business and and so on. And um, one of the concerns that comes up on the survey is um, um, prices or um, price perception is what we like to call it. Um, and uh, I, I like that term, price perception, because I, I get there and I look, look at the price on organic red peppers or whatever, or whatever it is, I'm, and I get a little bit of a sticker shock. The few times I step into a commercial store and look at um, their prices on organic produce, if you can find their organic produce, you'll find out that our price is actually pretty competitive. And so, and we're doing that at the same time that we're paying our help better, giving them a better benefit package, and doing a lot of more altruistic things in the community. So uh, the first thing I would say is it may not be as bad as it appears. And the second thing I would say is I'm pretty sure our team is committed to delivering the best product they can at an affordable price. Um, getting back to what you were saying earlier, I think the statistic you were looking for is sales per labor hour and um, our cost for, or the labor cost for a given amount of sales. And I think ours might be a little bit on the high side. And that's primarily because the store has a, um, a significant volume of business in a relatively uh, restricted space, and so it does require more effort on the part of the staff to keep the shelf stocked so that when we get there, the thing we want is on it. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I've been bringing up that this is a, one of the priorities we need to look at, and so if I can look at that, you know, balance sheet, get that transparency from the general manager, then that would kind of help address the situation. But I would also agree with Steve. I think, you know, as a poor struggling person on food stamps who also shops at Walmart and Shaw's and you know, wherever I can get something the cheapest um, for milk, for spices, for, a, there's a, a basket of goods that is actually the cheapest at the co-op. Um, particularly, you know, the cheapest, the hypoallergenic version of X is the cheapest at the co-op. And I think making sure we communicate that to the community, uh, that people know about that is really important because I think there are a lot of folks out there who go to the you know, stores that are famously known for being affordable, uh, not knowing that there are certain products that might have a better deal at the co-op. Um, you know, just the stereotype is that the co-op is expensive, right? Uh, but another thing is that, you know, I benefit from the co-op cares program, and I think, you know, expanding that program in whatever way works for the balance sheet, you know, can we make it a deeper discount for members who get food stamps and, and can use that program, or can we make it even an automatic discount for regular community folks who are not members using a food stamp card. Um, are there ways like that that we can kind of reach those folks and um, provide some sort of re relief from the general uh, nationwide crisis of, of food price inflation? Um, I think that's all worth looking at. So I think one would have to ask the general manager about the comparison of costs uh, at the co-op versus other places. But I would also suggest that if one shops in the bulk department, one gets very good prices. And if we put some effort into letting people know that and perhaps putting recipes on the bulk bins for simple recipes for those items, people might be more willing to shop there, to, to buy them. I mean, that's what I do. It keeps my grocery bill somewhat reasonable. 
So this is one of those questions that's tricky for me as an employee. Um, but using information that's publicly available, things that we've shared for the past 20 years at every annual meeting, um, if you compared Hunger Mountain to other places, Hunger Mountain's always been an extremely strong um, position. Um, you know, sales per labor foot, what you were talking about, we're, we're getting that money out of every, you know, we are at the top area of, of maximizing sales for the space we have. Um, but I think, so having been at the co-op for a long time and, and shopped there for a long time, um, for a long time we would say we need to educate shoppers about food, you know, the value of food and that they should spend a higher percentage and, and really value their food. But I think that today with what's going on, that is almost condescending. Like our, our shoppers know they come to us because we have local, because we have organic. But I think that we, we really do need to address the affordability issue. Um, and I think there's lots of ways to do that inside of the co-op's guidelines for its food. Um, but a lot of that is not work that the council would do. So I think that the best way that we can do that is by supporting the general manager. Um, I do know that the staff think about this constantly, that, that this is a big issue. It's a big issue for everybody in Montpelier, Vermont. I mean, Vermont has got some issues with affordability. Um, so I think listening to, to our members and our shoppers and being able to, um, be a cohesive unit that, that can get through our work and put the time in necessary to support the staff. Um, that's, I think, the best way to move forward on that. I think that this issue is widely known. So I think that's. OK, I'll ask uh, one final question. And please, after I ask this, if anyone in the audience has another question, please don't hesitate. And then we can do some closing statements. What is your vision for the future of the co-op? Um, I would love in 10 years to see the co-op uh, still thriving with um, as much sales and growth that is appropriate for our community. Um, and I would love to see us in other areas involved in other things. And I don't know what those things are, but you know, maybe it's community housing, maybe it's um, a different sort of retail good or food, or maybe it's a community hub, but I would love to see us uh, play an even larger role in our community. I'd like to see us thriving, for sure. Um, I'd like to see us talking with other community, with other co-ops about things like a storage area for winter vegetables so that we could have local winter veg local vegetables in the winter. Um, and I'd like to see us thinking about other things that we could do that are important within the community. Um, I'd like to see us doing something. Um, that's not going to work. Let's see. Perhaps doing some sort of an apprenticeship program with the local high school um, where students come in work part-time, but learn about groceries, produce, management skills, so that then they may want to come and work for us. But whether they do or not, they'll be picking up skills that are valuable to the community. I'd like us to do things with recycling. With Like we get a lot of cartons, cartons and cartons of stuff. What are we doing with that? And just generally putting our minds into where we can use the stuff that we discard. Maybe it would work for, maybe cartons would work for insulation. I don't know, but just to be thinking more about when we bring stuff into the store, where does it go out? <laughs> and using it in some way that's good for the community. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think, you know, 10 years from now, uh, a lot of things could be different nationally, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I'm really hoping uh, that the Affordable Housing Activism can make some progress and, you know, um, sort of addressing some of Steve's concerns earlier about, you know, I, I think most of the Hunger Mountain Co-op's carbon footprint is probably people driving to it in cars, right? And so seeing that changed both in um, 
affordable living space so that Montpelier gets a little bit denser. Fewer people are, are forced to live in the outskirts and, and commute as far, and also having you know, other kinds of transit. I mean, can we bring back trolleys? Can even just electric buses, you know? Um, those kinds of, of options are something that's sort of beyond the purview of the co-op council, but something that would really help the co-op to thrive and be more sustainable. Um, but yeah, I think also, you know, community housing, as people mentioned, certain initiatives like that are things that the co-op could actually look at to support um, those kinds of things and help the community and the co-op integrate better. How about a flying co-op? One that delivers its goods by drone. Uh, whatever, whatever works. Um, uh, to me, it's innovation, innovation, innovation. Um, I, I, uh, I have had the privilege and pleasure of attending three co-op conferences, um, known to those of us who've been to them as CCMA. We get an opportunity to meet an awful lot of other folks from other co-ops and learn of some of the things that they're doing and they get to learn what we're doing. And uh, as far as my, you know, my dream, my vision for 10 years from down the road, I would like to see Hunger Mountain become a model that other co-ops aspire to. Thank you, Scott. Carl Entenayer. One of the main tasks of the council is to manage the general manager. That's the single employee that the council has, and occasionally to hire the general manager. This last year, we hired 20-year store veteran Mary Mullally as GM after you know, she started 20 years ago as cashier. I'm wondering, now that she's still relatively new in this position, what approach that you have to managing an employee to help her succeed in the job? Um, I think being receptive and, and listening um, and being able to work together to figure out ways to support things that come up. So, just being open, I think, is the most important. I would agree. We need to be listening to each other and to all the members of the community, you know, staff and members and outside community people, as well as management and council, and, and be listening to each other and try to resolve things and make decisions from that larger group. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I think, um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience managing an employee directly, um, but I do have some experience, you know, tutoring people in math. And so like checking someone's numbers, right? And, and the, finding a, a way to do that. And so encouraging that kind of transparency so that we can all like, as council look at the budget and um, go through and check things is uh, something I could apply some experience to and would definitely be interested in, in helping with. Uh, I didn't know our new GM needed any management. I thought she was fine without it. But uh, actually, the, um, we have in place, actually, a, I think a pretty good system of, of um, monitoring, which um, follows the policies that the council has put forth about how the store should be, what the store is and how it should be run. And we have a set of uh, monitoring reports that come out every, that Mary generates or the GM generates every every meeting for us to look at and see how the store is running. And I think, I think the best way is to read and understand those reports, make sure we know what's going on. And if we have ideas or suggestions, offer those. And at the same time, be supportive of what she brings to us as needs that need to be met. Any last questions that come to mind? Okay. We're pretty much on schedule here. Oh, well, uh, closing statements. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, now's your opportunity um, to uh, kind of su sum summarize um, your positions, uh, re uh, reiterate any, uh, your commitment to the, to the co-op, and uh, Make your final appeal to the voters. Uh, if I was to make a final appeal, I would say that you should vote just because you should vote. You should participate in the process. 
Um, if I had, I mean, we're, we're in a unique situation here, or maybe it's not that unique the past couple of years, but um, I would say if I was gonna have any pitch of why you should vote for me in particular, um, I would say it's because um, I am prepared to make sure I fulfill the length of my term and put the work in necessary to do the work. Hi. Um, oh, okay. So I have a whole, a whole list of things. Um, but basically, that I'll be accessible and listen to members' concerns and bring them to the council. And that I'll do the things I've committed to, you know, checking financials and finan benchmarks as they are presented to the general manager, from the general manager, um, constantly asking questions. I know it's the bane of Carl's life, <laughs> but, um, but it's important for us to know and understand what's happening. And I'll be advocating for pay raises for, for the employees, you know. Um, I would make some suggestions that we have materials available for people uh, where there are disabilities, either sight or mobility or hearing or language, that we have some way to, com to uh, allow that or invite those people to participate in co-op activities. I would advocate for keeping control as much as possible, local as much as possible. I guess that's it. Please vote for me. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think you know I've uh, said a lot of uh, what I came to say, but um, just reiterating that I am a uh, working class young person who I know a lot of co-op employees, and I know some employees of co-op vendors, and so I, I'm I think particularly qualified to kind of represent those interests on the council and make sure that you know. Um, the people who often struggle the most with affordability and those kinds of issues are represented both on the employee and customer side and vendor side. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, given the open seats and all that and my progressive activism experience, I've had a lot of opportunities to say, you know, it, if, we, if you vote, we win. Uh, I've never felt more confident than in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I just would like to point out that uh, for those of us who are incumbents, I know that our co uh, contact information is available on the website and on a poster uh, near the exit of the store. I'm, I think the other candidate's contact information is available too, is it not? Uh, does anybody know the answer to that? Well, it's the, yeah, it's right in front of me, but I don't know if it's available to folks who are listening. But anyway, uh, as far as I'm concerned personally, feel, feel free to, um, um, uh, reach out to me if you have questions or concerns or uh, unadulterated praise. And um, please vote early and often, and thank you very much for your support. And I'll add that it is important to vote because the council is um, comprised of nine members, and, uh, and every, every year three members come up for a three-year term. So since we have so many, we just have so many people running for um, both open seats and for uh, incumbency, the top three getters, the top three um, candidates that receive the most votes will get the three-year term, um, and then it'll, those that get less will, won't have the full three years. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, moderating for you, and, and thank you for coming, and uh, good luck to all the candidates. You ha we, have a, we have a wonderful co-op. And th thank you, Scott, for moderating tonight and all the candidates for coming. Thanks to everyone who came out here and to Orca for making this available to the wider, wider co-op membership. Uh, in just a minute, we'll welcome you to mix informally with the candidates and uh, enjoy more of the, the good food that's out there. Uh, before we do that, I just want to, I mean, we're here to hear perspectives from the candidates, uh, but I just want to uh, 
add a little bit of perspective on a couple of things. Uh, one is that the local press has consistently misreported the uh, sexual harassment scandal that was mentioned here. And, and if that's the only place you get the information about it, you could be for, forgiven uh, for thinking that uh, there were more victims who came forward than, than actually did to management. But um, Mary Mullally, our interim GM at the time, uh, put out a statement uh, expressing what actually happened, uh, which is on the co-op website. Uh, I believe it was in the beginning of September in 2023. So if you go to the news site, you can find that. And if you want a direct link to it, you can email me, Carl E at hungermountain.coop. Uh, the other thing is um, we, we talk about, we're focusing because we're members uh, here voting on, on these folks, on the um, folks that we elect, but there is also, in the context of labor relations, there's a staff representative on the council too. So we're actually 10 people on the council, and one of the ways that we get information uh, from the staff is through the staff representative. We don't currently have one. We, we look forward to the union electing another one so that we'll have that voice at the table as well. And of course, annual meeting is coming up on November 7th, and we hope that we will see all of you there. So thanks so much for coming.